Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Mad Barn Academy. And if you're new here, then welcome. We hope to earn your subscription today. I'm Dr. Fran Rowe, one of the veterinary nutritionists here at Mad Barn. Our topic of discussion for today's video is going to be on EPM or equine protozoal myoencephalitis. EPM is a really important disease that's unique to the Americas, and I think that most of us are familiar with it. Either we've had a horse or have known a horse that's been affected, or we hear about it talked a lot from you know a variety of sources, whether that's social media or our other horse friends or our farrier or whatever the case may be. So I thought it would be a really great topic to dive into today. So let's get started and kind of figure out why this is such a hot topic among horse owners. EPM is a neurological disease of horses. It's caused by an infection with a protozoal organism, a little tiny parasitic organism, that damages the brain and or the spinal cord. The two protozoa that have been identified as causative agents in this disease are Sarcocystis neurona and Neospora hugesi. A majority of the, the cases are caused by the former, Sarcocystis neurona. What's interesting, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, is that many horses are exposed to one or both of these pathogens, but a very, very small number of those horses will actually develop disease or clinical EPM. It's generally very treatable, but not all horses will fully recover from the infection. So how do horses get exposed to this pathogen? Well, we understand the life cycle and routes of transmission of Sarcosis neurona really rather well. S. neurona undergoes a two-host life cycle. Part of its maceration requires an intermediate host before transferring to the definitive host. S. neurona is a normal parasite of the opossum, who is considered the definitive host. The opossum will pass immature life stages of this parasite in its feces. You can kind of think of this as passing little eggs in its feces, which are then consumed by the intermediate host when they're foraging on, you know, contaminated feed or water sources. S. neurona will then undergo some maturation in the intermediate host's muscle tissue, but cannot complete its full life cycle until it's back inside of the opossum. So if that intermediate host dies, it will be scavenged by the opossum who consumes that infected muscle tissue. Our life cycle is complete. S. neurona can now complete its life cycle and fully mature once it's inside the opossum. Several different intermediate hosts have been identified, including domestic cats, raccoons, armadillos, and skunks. Horses become infected the same way that our intermediate hosts do by consuming feed or water that's been contaminated with opossum feces infected with S. neurona. However, equids are not part of this parasite's normal life cycle, and horses are considered a dead end or aberrant host. This means that when horses consume those parasitic eggs, the parasite cannot undergo or complete its normal life cycle, and it just gets stuck inside the horse. As such, infected horses really pose no risk of transmission to other horses. So that's the life cycle of Sarcosis neurona. Unfortunately, our understanding of Neospora hugesi is poor, and we really don't understand or know how uh, and hugesi is transmitted or where it kind of hides out in the wild. You know, what species are the definitive host for this pathogen? Other Neospora species that are closely related reside inside canids, so dogs, coyotes, things like that. But it's unknown if N. hugesi specifically is going to be the same. So the geographic range of EPM is going to be very closely related to the geographic range of its host species. We know that the opossum is the definitive host for S. neurona specifically. So where do we really find these critters and kind of where can we expect to see EPM most frequently? The native range of the opossum includes 
the entirety of the eastern U.S. and then all the way down into Central America. There are established populations west of the Rocky Mountains today, but those populations are really transplants from our eastern populations that, you know, those, those animals got introduced to that region. Generally, the opossum does not reside farther north than the U.S.-Canadian border, at least um, uh, historically. However, milder winters and human activity have made it possible for them to kind of expand their range northwards. So today, opossums can be found in the southernmost regions of Ontario, Quebec, and uh, British Columbia. So as such, EPM is a very rare disease of horses in Canada. Uh, there have been a few case reports of EPM being diagnosed in Canadian horses, uh, but exposure to this disease is, is not nearly as common as it is in the U.S., and we'll touch on that a bit later. Okay, now let's get into kind of what does EPM actually look like when a horse becomes infected. So the clinical signs of EPM will greatly depend on what part of the central nervous system is affected, the brain, the brainstem, and or the spinal cord, and sometimes multiple areas can be affected. Additionally, the onset of clinical signs can really vary horse to horse. Sometimes it's a very acute and profound presentation uh, where these horses are found suddenly to be very neurologic. Other times it's a very chronic progression um, with kind of slow, insidious onset of those clinical signs over a long period of time. Horses with brain or brain stem involvement may present with kind of the following clinical signs here uh, highlighted in blue. So we might see cranial nerve deficits such as a head tilt, drooping of the eyes, ears, or muzzle, difficulty swallowing, upper airway dysfunction. We might also see central brain signs like seizures, blindness, uh, obtundation, or kind of which is a, a diminished responsiveness to uh, external stimuli if you go to touch the horse or talk to the horse, something like that. Horses with more spinal cord involvement may present with the following signs highlighted in yellow here. Commonly, we'll, we'll see incoordination or kind of stumbling, tripping, uh, interference, uh, weakness. That horse may just appear very uh, kind of weak and lethargic. They may lean on things or lay down more often. An atypical gait, uh, and that can really look like anything, right? Atypical gait, whether uh, the limbs are a little bit more spastic in their movement, maybe they're dragging their feet more, and sometimes that gait can even mimic a mild lameness. And then a, kind of one of the very um, kind of textbook signs of EPM is this asymmetrical muscle atrophy, and it's most uh, obvious uh, when it affects the muscles of the top line or uh, the rump, the gluteals. Now, what makes EPM a really challenging disease to deal with is the fact that it's not super easy to diagnose or to test for. A definitive diagnosis is made post-mortem after the horse has died and uh, sections of the brain and spinal cord can be looked at under the microscope. Of course, this is not practical <laughs> for those of us in day-to-day -day life uh, dealing with our horses. So for living horses, we test for the presence of antibodies against the pathogen, either S. neurona or N. hugesi, and that's called a titer, an antibody titer. The gold standard for EPM diagnosis is to submit both blood and cerebrospinal fluid for antibody testing. Per the consensus statement on EPM released by the American Association of Equine Practitioners, or AAEP, the following diagnostic protocol is recommended for suspect cases of EPM. First, a neurological exam of the horse should yield clinical signs that are consistent with EPM. That seems obvious to say, but, uh, you know, we really want to be looking for those kind of textbook clinical signs that are going to point us in the direction of EPM versus any number of other neurological diseases. Second, additional diagnostics should be performed with available tools 
to rule out other neurological conditions. That might mean taking radiographs of the cervical spine to rule out wobblers or submitting a nasal swab for EHV1, uh, examples like that. Lastly on our list is submitting that blood or serum and CSF for antibody testing for our uh, best kind of gold standard diagnosis. So submitting blood for an antibody titer isn't necessarily the hard part. It's deciding whether or not that titer indicates exposure versus active clinical disease. And that's where the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF comes in. It helps us determine if there's an active infection within that brain or spinal cord versus just antibodies circulating in the bloodstream because of a past exposure to this pathogen. So obviously collecting a blood sample is much easier than collecting a CSF sample, especially for vets um, out in the field. So it's common for only serum to be submitted. However, interpreting serum alone can be tricky. On the first slide, I mentioned that many horses are exposed to either Sarcosis neurona or Neospora hugesi. So let's explore kind of what these numbers look like further. The data here is taken from a 2017 study uh, that sought to establish the zero prevalence of antibodies against S. neurona and N. hugesi in healthy horses in the United States. So zero prevalence is defined as the number of individuals in a population that test positive for a particular disease using blood serum samples. So for example, with this data, 84% of healthy horses in the South, which this study defined the South as Texas uh, up through West Virginia there, uh, had a positive titer to S. neurona. So the big takeaway from this study is that the seroprevalence for both of these EPM agents is relatively high, particularly for S. neurona. This highlights that exposure is really rather common across all regions of the United States, and a majority of horses will test positive on blood work. And remember, with this study, these results came from healthy horses. These horses were not neurologic. They were not being evaluated for neurological disease or suspect EPM at all. And that means that a positive result on blood work doesn't automatically equal an active EPM infection. It just indicates that this horse has been exposed to this pathogen. This is why EPM remains a diagnostic challenge. And the gold standard for diagnosis is to submit both serum and CSF samples. A horse with an active EPM infection will produce intrathecal antibodies because the protozoa infects the central nervous system. The intrathecal space, or the space around the brain, around the spinal cord, is protected by the blood-brain barrier, and so antibodies will only be present in this space if there's active infection. So we understand that all horses are susceptible to this pathogen or these two pathogens really, but it's clear that not every horse that is exposed to either uh, S. neurona or N. hugesi will become sick or become clinically affected with EPM. And in fact, only really less than 1% of these horses will develop active EPM, which is really fortunate, thank goodness. However, it's unclear why some of these horses progress to clinical disease and why others do not. Currently, it's theorized that immune suppression or an inadequate immune response is the key between the healthy horse and the EPM horse. But what causes the immune system to struggle in these cases? That we really don't know, but risk factors like stress, um, whether that be, you know, trailering, heavy exercise, things like that, concurrent illness or age at the time of exposure have been identified by researchers. So if we have a horse that's been diagnosed with EPM, what can we do about it? 
Well, back in the day, our treatment options for EPM were extremely limited, but today we're quite fortunate to have several drugs on the market that are effective in treating this disease. The three products labeled for use in horses that you may have heard of include uh, Panazaril, uh, trade name Marquis, Diclazaril, trade name Protozil, or the sulfadiazine pimethramine <laughs> combination, which is rebalance. Treatment can take several months, and fortunately, the majority of horses will improve. Many of those horses will go back to their original level of exercise, which is excellent. However, not all horses respond favorably to treatment. It's estimated that 30 to 40 percent of these horses will either stabilize in their neurological condition, meaning they don't get any better, but they also don't get any worse, or they will continue to decline in their neurological status. Furthermore, it's thought that a portion of these horses will relapse within two years of treatment, becoming neurological again. Okay, let's end today discussing prevention strategies. Limiting our horse's exposure to these pathogens, specifically S. neurona, since that's the one we understand the best, uh, means automatically that we've got to limit uh, exposure to that definitive host, the possum. So for most of us, it's inevitable that critters will come around the barn. <laughs> they're looking for food, they're looking for places to shelter, and often our barns really do provide that for them. So the best thing that we can do to prevent exposure to EPM is to stay vigilant about signs of wildlife activity and discourage wildlife from wanting to come around the barn. This means ensuring that our feed bins are properly secured and tamper-proof, not leaving feed, dirty buckets, horse treats, anything tasty uh, that wildlife might be interested out uh, in the open. Maintaining general sanitation and disposal of garbage around the barn and eliminating suitable places to den or uh, suitable places for these wildlife to kind of shelter and tuck into, like wood piles, open hay storage, and certainly seal off kind of any accessible areas into the barn or storage areas that might be a cozy place to hang out. Also, Remember that food left out for barn, um, barn cats and your farm dogs will certainly attract wildlife. So it's best to feed barn animals away from where the horses are stabled and not to leave that food out 24-7. Uh, and then lastly, remember that communal water sources uh, for the horses, like a trough out in the field, uh, will also serve as a communal water source for wildlife. So be sure to clean buckets and clean troughs frequently to reduce any fecal contamination from visiting critters. Some of you might be wondering if it's safe to keep barn cats around since they can serve as an intermediate host for Sarcosis neurona. And the short answer is yes, it's perfectly fine to keep your barn cats around they serve as an intermediate host, and intermediate hosts cannot pass the parasite on to horses. Additionally, cats do play an important role in pest control and managing their territory, which can discourage wildlife from coming around. Now, if you ever do have a critter that takes up residence around your farm, be sure to call pest control or a wildlife specialist to have that animal relocated. Opossums play a really critical role in our ecosystem as scavengers, and they also eat a lot of other pests like ticks. So we want them around. We just don't want them right there in our barn. So please call a trapper and humanely trap that animal and have it relocated to a, a new appropriate location. All right, you guys, here are our references for today. And thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and be sure to check out the other videos on our channel. We have things coming out all the time on a variety of topics. So there's often something there for everybody. And be sure to check out the additional links I've provided in the description of this video below if you wanna learn a little bit more about EPM in horses and do a deeper dive. Okay, until next time, thanks.